All right, so that brings us to uh, dealing with um, physics rather than logistics of the course. And the best place to start in any mechanics course is with Newton's laws, because ultimately, in the end, any mechanics course is basically just a course on Newton's laws. Um, so you'll have seen them in high school, you've seen them in first year. I don't want to spend ages on them. I just want to make sure that we're all on the same page with exactly what's going on so that uh, no one can get further along in the course and say, oh, but we didn't define this thing properly. So basically, in the end, we have three laws attributed to Newton. Um, each of them have a different role in mechanics, and um, all of them are useful at various points and we connect various ideas to them. So let's look at them as a sequence of three. We have Newton's first law, which basically says in the absence of forces, a particle moves with constant velocity. Um, basically, if there's no force on something, it keeps moving, it keeps doing what it does until um, such time as a force acts and changes its velocity. Um, the second law is the one that has a quantitative relationship, and it's probably, as a first year student, the one that you tend to use the most because physics being a quantitative thing, you want to try and um, get numbers out for um, various quantities, and so you want to be able to do calculations. So the second law basically says that for any particle of mass m, the net force on the particle is always equal to the mass m times the particle's acceleration. Um, so we can write a, an equation that looks more or less like f equals ma, um, where anything I have in bold in here is a vector, so force is a vector, acceleration is a vector, it's a direction tied to it, mass is not, it's, so it's a scalar, it's not bold in um, most of the equations that I'll put in my slides. And as you probably know, we can connect this to the rate of change of momentum. And just to introduce um, some, some um, notation in here, um, often instead of writing dp on dt, um, in mechanics we write p with a dot over the top of it to represent time derivative. Okay? Um, if it's a derivative with respect to something else, often it's a dash rather than a spot over the top spot over the top is usually res um, reserved strictly for time derivatives um, and in my course that was certain derivatives. The last one is the one that's often ignored um, but is actually quite important. Um, third, Newton's third law and basically says if object one exerts a force F21 on object two, then object two always exerts a reaction force F12 on object one with uh, F12 being equal to minus F21. Okay, so basically what it says is that for every force applied, there's an equal and opposite force applied in the opposite direction. Um, probably the best way to think about this is that um, the third law is just conservation of momentum. Um, and so we should have a, a, a quick quick look at this. Um, let me just pop that slide for a second. Um, So we have two objects, right? Um, and let's assume that we've got forces here that are acting as action at a distance. So um, something like Coulomb force or something like that, where you have two separate objects, no mechanical connection between them, one applies a force on the other. Um, gravity is another good example of this. So what we have here is um, object one. Uh, it's applying, you know, it's experiencing some force, F12, um, direction to the right. Um, we've got object two here, um, experiencing some force, F21, to the left, and that will be minus F12 in here. Okay, and so this could be um, uh, two, two planets um, exerting gravitational force on each other. Um, or it could be, um, you know, a moon and a space station, as you'll see in my notes. Um, small little Star Wars joke for those who are Star Wars fans. Um, so let's assume that we've got a moon and a Death Star. Um, those who did my quantum mechanics course will know that uh, quantum Darth Vader would be very happy about um, his uh, Death Star turning up in um, his two one on three. Um, We've got these two forces acting between the two, and what we want to have a look at is what happens if those two bodies have a force that's acting to something else outside that system. So it could be a moon and a Death Star and a planet, 
like those of you who've seen Return of the Jedi will know that uh, you've got um, uh, Endor and there's a moon in the sky and there's a Death Star in the sky, right? So you can imagine that these two things have a gravity between each other. Remember, as you two as a planet, and we need to sort that out. Um, so let's take this a step further and look at the problem of um, here's our moon. Is our Death Star, and they've got a force between the two, so we bring this this force back in again. F one two, F two one, and they both have an external force towards some other object in some other direction. So we've got uh, what we would call here F one external, and here F two. External. And that can be some gravitational attraction towards some other thing. Right? So what we want to do usually in physics is work out um, total forces on things. Um, you can have a, you can have an object that's subjected to a whole pile of different forces, and as you know from first year, you can add all those forces together via a vector addition and get what the total force on the object is. Um, so if we look at the total total force on the moon. It's going to be uh, let's call it F one, um, and when I when I write um, vectors um, in my notes here, if it really needs to be explicitly put as a vector, I'll put a little arrow over the top of it. Um, it will be our force F one two plus force one external, and the vectors on top. Um, basically imply that that's a vector sum, so you need to count the direction at the same time as you're accounting for magnitudes um, in doing that. And of course we can work out what the total force is on the, uh, the Death Star, it's called DS. Um, so that will be F2, will be F21, plus F2 external. And so those two equations mirror each other as you would expect because they're basically just vector sums of your forces. So what we're going to do here is try and connect the third law of uh, Newton's third law with conservation of momentum. So what we want to do here is basically use Newton's second law to get us the momentum change and then look at what comes out of that to convince ourselves that Newton's third law gives us conservation of momentum. This is where we're going. So we can use um, Newton's second law, um, and we can do this on um, the moon first, so dp1 on dt, um, which is really just p1 dot, okay? So if I go back to, um, to my slide, um, you'll see that basically f equals um, p dot in here. So I'm just comparing the force to uh, the derivative with respect to the momentum. So this thing is f, um, F1, uh, like so. And of course, these two quantities over on the left are, um, are vectors as well. Okay, I don't want to put too much notation on there because it's going to get all clumsy and messed up. But uh, one of the key things in physics is to know what is a vector and what isn't a vector, and then you have to treat them as vectors and so forth. So um, there's a little bit of context you have to get used to there, but you, you get it anyway. Um, and so, of course, we have an expression for force one above. It's F12 plus F1 uh, X. Right. Um, so let's call this equation one for a moment just to keep track of it. And we can write exactly the same thing for um, the Death Star in this problem, right? P2. So P2 dot will be um, F2. Um, equals f to one uh, plus f to experiments. And let's call this equation two, just to keep track of things. Okay, so the total momentum, um, given we just have two objects we care about at the moment, and what we're really doing here is going moon, death star is a system, so we can draw a little dotted line around it and consider that to be our system. And then we have, you know, whatever the planet is, that is exerting an external force. It's, of course, outside this little line. So it's outside our system, and it's an external thing. So we're referring to it as external already, right? And so what we're caring about here is the total momentum of our just 
two objects moving and death star um, subject um, to an external force from the outside. Okay. So total momentum uh, P is going to be P1 plus P2. And of course, this would be a vector equation if we were writing it up properly. Okay, so if you have a look at my actual formal written notes, I haven't labeled them in vectors because I just know they're vectors, right? I know these quantities to move. We can take the time derivative of all the terms here, right? And so I'm going to drop the vectors from the top um, just because they're going to get in the way of the dots that I want for my time derivative. Um, so you can take the derivative of both sides. And so that's going to give us p dot is equal to p1 dot plus p2 dot, okay? And now what we can do is we can take from equations one or two, we've got a couple of lines up, and basically insert p1 dot and p2 dot into that. So let's do that. We can use one and two. And so what we can write here is that p dot is equal to f1, two, plus F1 external, um, plus F21 plus F2 external. And we know from um, Newton's third law that F21 is equal to minus F12, or you could put it as F12 is equal to minus F21, right? They're, 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 they're opposite signs of each other. So what we really have in here is uh, F12 plus F one external minus F12. So this bit here comes from Newton's third law um, plus F2 external. And of course, these, these two terms here cancel out. So what we're left is with F1 external plus F2 external. And so what this is, is really just the total external force um, in the system. Right, it's just another vector sum. Um, perfectly good. Now, one thing we want to consider is um, consider the case where the force, the external force, is equal to zero. Okay, so you can imagine, for example, the Death Star has just destroyed the planet. The planet's not there anymore, so it's not even the asteroid field, it's just completely gone. And now all we're left with is Moon and Death Star, and we've no longer got an external force, there's no longer anything there to generate that force. Um, so if we consider the external force equal to zero, then what that means is that P dot must be equal to zero, right? And of course, P dot is the total momentum of the system, which is the planet plus, um, sorry, the Moon plus the Death Star. Um, and if P dot is equal to zero, we can integrate that back to P, and that means that P is constant, right? So in the end, what really the third law enables us to do when we combine it with the second law is to say that if we take any system of bodies, and it could be one, it could be two, it could be many, and I'll show you many in a second, just so that you get used to some notation, um, then, Combining those two things together says that if there's no external force, then the momentum of that system is conserved, right? So really the third law exists essentially there to guarantee us that we have conservation. Okay, so there's two outcomes from an analysis of just a simple um, two object system under external force that we just looked at. Um, one is that in the absence of external forces, the total momentum of the multi-object system is conserved. In other words, it's constant, right? So um, if I have moon, death star, nothing else out there, um, there's no external force. These two things, if I consider their momentum together, that momentum is conserved, um, irrespective of what's happening with any internal forces um, between them on the inside. Um, and that leads us directly to our corollary, which is basically for a multi-object system, the internal forces have no effect as far as the total momentum of the system as a whole is concerned. So you'll notice if we look at the, um, the momentum we end up with in the end there that's, that's constant, it's got no terms that depend on F1, 2, or F2, 1. So the actual internal forces between the objects in that system play no role um, in the sort of overall momentum um, of that system as a system. And it basically allows us in mechanics 
um, to decouple certain parts um, of multi-component systems into systems and external forces and then know what's uh, being conserved in terms of momentum um, at various parts of the system. It's actually a really useful thing to know. Okay, um, before I move on, what I want to do is just show you very quickly that this actually holds not just for two bodies, but for a large number of bodies. And just to introduce um, some more advanced notation, um, the way that more, uh, mechanics works. And a lot of times in mechanics, um, what we often do is take a system, we deal with it either on a single particle basis or on a two particle basis, and then we extend that result up to three, to five, to a thousand, to a million, to 200,000 billion um, particles. And then that, that enables us to make rather more complex bodies. Um, so for example, when you do rotational dynamics, um, you can treat rather complicated shaped objects essentially as the sum of a whole pile of little pieces, all of which get added together um, to um, give you your whole body. And you treat them as individual pieces and you can rely on the step from one to two to multiple particles in order to build um, those physical ideas up. We'll have a look at a, a little bit how that works um, in one of the later lectures. So let's just skip up here and do this for um, a, a multi-particle system. So we've got one particle in here, the whole alpha in the middle. Um, and we've got a whole pile of little particles around it. And just to keep track of notation, let's call them uh, beta, um, delta, um, gamma, and uh, epsilon, or z. Okay? And the one we care about is this one in the just color, color for that. Okay? Now there's going to be pair forces between each of these. It could be gravity, or they could be a bunch of electrons, and it could be Coulomb force, or whatever it is, right? So we would have some force along here that we would call force alpha gamma. We'd have some force along here that we would call force alpha beta. We'd have some force here that we would call force alpha delta, uh, alpha epsilon just here. And we might have, we might consider this to be a five particle system and have something outside that that's generating an external force. Um, and so we would have some external force here, um, F alpha external. Okay. And of course, every one of these four objects sitting around it will have um, a force acting back towards alpha. So we could write um, in here in opposition to our little um, force alpha epsilon, um, we would have a little force epsilon alpha. Sorry, uh, that's alpha. And of course, those individual ones could have forces to each other. Right, so there might be another force over here that we would call um, force um, epsilon delta and so forth. So we could have whole piles of chains of forces in here and tangle ourselves up in a giant nightmare that we have to worry about. Okay? Let's keep it simple for now and just ignore these uh, um, other forces because usually um, Newton's second law takes care of them um, in terms of conservation and mental we'll show that. Okay. All right. So we're going to follow the same line of argument that we just followed in the last one, which is we're going to care about the net force. We're going to turn that net force into a momentum and then show that that momentum, momentum is conserved, right? So what we're interested in here is the net force on alpha. And it's going to be um, a force, we'll call it force alpha. It's going to be the sum of over i not equal to alpha of f alpha i so i would be beta delta gamma epsilon and we've strictly ruled out that uh, i can be alpha because we can't really have a force acting on the same body itself okay um, so we're just knocking out the one case that kind of gives us a silly um, answer and then the other thing we have to add on to this will be the external force so this would be f alpha f alpha external All right, and so the same result would hold if you did it for beta and you did it for delta and so forth. You would have a whole pile of these equations and much the same as the first problem we did where we had one for the moon and one for a death star, here we'd have one for five of these particular combinations. We could write five equations down the page if we wanted to, write ourselves crazy. Um, 
We also have a total momentum. And it's a total momentum for the whole system, right? And when I mean the whole system, I basically mean I can draw myself a little bag um, around these five particles and consider those five particles together, right? So that total momentum P is going to be sum over alpha P alpha. Um, actually, I've been a little sloppy there with my notation. Let me go back here for a second and just write it like this. Um, it's actually going to be sum over I P I, right? But it's going to include all of the terms. So we have to include alpha, we have to include beta, we have to include gamma, epsilon, and delta as well. Okay, so it's all um, we can take the um, derivative of both sides again. So here we have time derivative p dot is going to just be sum over i um, p dot i. And then, of course, we need to do this over all the possible combinations as we work through the system. Um, and I've probably actually been a little sloppy with my notation here. And this is one thing that's really common when you do physics problems, actually. Um, I'm kind of liking that I made this mistake because um, I kind of get it as another opportunity to demonstrate good technique. Um, I've already used I and I've just gone and used it again. So what I'm going to do is get rid of these I's up here. I'm going to make them J so that things don't get, don't get confusing with this. Okay, so let's call this J, let's call this J, and let's call this J here and, and J just here, right? Um, and now what we need to do is we know that P dot is connected to our force, right? And so what we're going to do here is add over J and we're going to substitute in, so this thing up here would be something like P dot alpha, right? Um, the force, the net force on the particle is, is, is just P dot. So F alpha is P dot alpha. Um, what we can do is do sum over j, which means alpha, beta, blah, 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 and we can substitute in the p dot for that, and the p dot can be for one particular case. So what we're going to do here is look at the force on one particle due to all the other particles. Okay, so this would be um, f i um, not equal to alpha, f alpha i, um, and really when I talk about this as f alpha i, um, what I really mean in here is to take this alpha out here and basically put in a J, right? Oops. I I J J just there. Okay? So what we're really doing here is now linking all the little forces together and making sure that we don't count the same uh, the force of one object in itself. And then in all of this we're gonna have the external force of every single one of these bodies out here. Okay, so this would be now f sum over j of f um, j external. Okay. Um, so if we unpack this sum, what we've done is we've taken alpha, we've looked at all the combinations of the other five, and then we've realized that we have to add not just that, but all of the other five. We're looking at all the pairs in this in this whole big system, right? Okay. So this double sum that we've got here in the front. Um, actually has um, a lot of terms to it, right? If I have um, five particles in my system, there's five terms that come from the first sum and five minus one terms, which is four, that come from the second sum. So this thing is really n, n minus one terms um, in here. And then the sum on the end of the external forces would just be n. Okay, that's fine. We'll deal with that. Um, the interesting thing about n, n minus 1 is um, that it must be an even number. And um, I've said this in, in 2-1-1, but I'll say it for people who haven't been in 2 one one uh, When I came through as an undergraduate, I used to keep like a little exercise book and I would stick little mathematical facts in it, um, just useful things that popped up along the way. And I'd dig that book out before exams and just sit down one night and read it and remind myself of all the little bag of tricks that I had so that when I'm in to do exams, they were kind of fresh in my memory. And this is one of them, actually. Um, n, n minus 1 is always an even number. Let's think about this for a second. 
suppose n is 2, n minus 1 is 1, 1 times 2 is 2, 2 is an even number, okay? I can choose n to be 3 now. 3 is n, n minus 1 is 2, 3 by 2 is 6, it's an even number. And you can put any n you like in as long as it's 1 or greater, um, sorry, as long as it's 2 or greater, and you'll get an even number out. Um, at the end. And one thing that we know about any even number is that it's divisible by two. Um, so we can use a little trick here with this sum, and this is really a common approach in physics um, in problems a little bit like this. We basically um, use that uh, two to basically sort out terms into pairs um, to, to simplify an equation up a little bit. And this is the main reason why I wanted to do this problem for a large number of bodies was to, to get this approach across um, as well as the notation. Okay. So what we've got here, and my notation in the lecture is differing a little bit from my uh, notation in the notes, but that's probably a good thing because it'll force you to go through and, and work out what's real and what's um, independent of the notation. Okay. Okay, so I've now got a term like this one up on the left, let's just write it again for a second, sum over j, sum over i not equal to j, um, f, j, i. And I can write it as a sum of paired terms, okay? So what I can do is make this a sum over j time uh, of a sum over i greater than, than j. Um, so all the other particles bigger than that. Um, of terms f, j, i plus f, i, j, okay? And so what I've basically done is taken, suppose I've got five particles in the system. What I've got is 20 terms in this equation because um, n n minus 1 is 5 times 4 is 20. And what I've done is taken 20 separate forces and realised that all of them exist as pairs that correspond of one particle out and one particle back in. And so what I've done is rewrite a sum of 20 terms as a sum of 20 pairs, uh, sorry, a sum of a set of 10 pairs um, where I've clustered the pairs together, okay? Um, so that's what this second um, term really looks like in here. And the interesting thing that we know in here is that Newton's third law tells us that uh, Fji is going to be equal to minus Fij. Um, so every single one of these terms, Fji plus Fij, is equal to zero. Um, so this little equation that I have up here is basically sum, of j, uh, j, sum over j, sum over i greater than j of zero. And of course, when you add up a whole pile of zeros, you get zero, okay? Um, and so if I go back to my um, term for p dot, um, change the momentum of time, that's now zero plus the sum over um, uh, j, f, j, uh, external. And of course, the sum of um, all of the little components, uh, external forces, will be the external force of the whole system added together, right? So we can basically just call this the external force um, as a whole. So basically just done the same thing that I did in the first problem, instead of with two objects, with five objects. And of course, I can go down the same line. I can treat this external force um, as being zero. That will mean that P dot is equal to zero. And that, of course, will mean that P is equal to a constant. And so my momentum is conserved for that whole system, right? And we can take that from two to five to a thousand to a million and basically take, um, for example, this apple pen and treat it as a million um, atoms. It's a lot more than a million atoms in it, but um, a million small components in this pen, um, all of which act as a system that then interacts with some other system outside that. And that's the way that we build up complex bodies in mechanics. All right, so that sort of deals with the uh, third law of momentum uh, conservation. It's one thing that I want to get really locked down. The other thing that we need to deal with um, before we get to the end, end of the lecture is reference frames. And there's not really any mathematics connected to this um, that we need to derive. We basically just need to be really clear on what we mean by um, frames of reference. And in mechanics, um, 
normally we care about two types of frame, um, inertial reference frames and non-inertial reference frames. Um, when you get later in the course and you start dealing with special relativity, which uh, Ron will cover, um, we get a bit more fussy about frames of reference um, beyond that sometimes. Okay, so at first, when you, if you think back um, a, a couple of slides, um, we've basically looked through Newton's laws and we did a whole pile of stuff with the second law, a whole pile of stuff with the third law just then um, to basically pull out that the third law is connected to conservation and momentum. And the one that we've sort of ignored a little bit is the first law. Um, and at first it almost seems redundant. It's, it's, it's sort of almost a trivial statement if you think about it. In the absence of forces, a particle moves with constant velocity. Um, it's sort of an underpinning requirement for everything and then once you've got it, you just sort of move on. Um, but it's actually a really, it has a really important separate role, which is it, we use it to determine what are inertial frames of reference. Um, and we do that because we know that if there's no forces on an object, then the acceleration has to be zero by the second law. And that basically gives us the first law, right? Um, so let's go through the terms one by one here. What do we mean by frame of reference? A frame of reference is really just the coordinate system attached to, I guess you could say an observer, um, but really we mean observer in the same way that we mean it when we talk about quantum mechanics. It's not necessarily a sentient human being. It's just um, some way of tracking the system um, from a sort of mathematical, physical sense. So really we're just tacking the coordinate system um, as, a, as a frame of reference, some way of tracking position and momentum and velocity and acceleration and those sorts of things. And that coordinate system can be whatever you fancy. It could be something really simple like a Cartesian system, it could be a polar system, it could be a cylindrical system, it could be whatever you like. And the key thing about that uh, coordinate system in the end is, is mostly just where the zero is, right? What way you want to define the axes in, in your three-dimensional space and then where you're calling um, your zero. Okay, so we can have frames of reference and we can attach them to different things. Um, and so when I think about frames of reference, I always like to think back to um, something that kind of really shocked me when I was, um, you know, 10 years old. And so when I, was, when I was young, lived way out in the suburbs and sometimes as a special treat, my grandmother used to take us into the city and we'd go watch a movie. And so there'd be a one hour train trip attached to that. We get on the train, going to the city. It's all fun when you're a little kid. And one of the things I remember from, um, from that was being at Central Station, um, sitting in the train. Um, and the best place to do this is actually the bottom um, car of the train in Australia, because usually the platform is at sort of uh, just about eye level um, out the window. And so you're sitting in the train, and on one side you've got the platform, which is stationary. You're inside the train, which is stationary. Um, people are getting on and off. Maybe they're wasting time um, with the doors open. And another train pulls up alongside on the next platform and stops. And the interesting thing you notice is that if you get absorbed with what's happening in the next train, and of course you can't see the platform on the other side of the train now because you can't see it through. Um, windows very easily. If you look at the train next to you, one of them starts moving and you don't know which one it is. And I thought uh, when I was a kid, you know, we start moving and I assumed it was us moving. And actually what was really happening was it was the other train heading in the opposite direction and was still stationary next to the platform, which I could tell by looking out the window and checking um, the platform. Okay, so you can imagine there you've got three distinct reference frames. You've got a frame of reference that's tied to an observer that would be on the platform and they would see the train go one way and the train go the other way. You can have a frame of reference tied to the person on the train, and then when they go forward, they see the platform go in the opposite direction, and the train next to them will either um, go that way um, while they're stationary, or if they both start moving at the same time, will be fixed um, relative to that reference frame. And then you can have a reference frame that's tied into the other train, right? Which as far as uh, it's concerned, when it comes in, it sees these two objects heading towards it, it sits there, 
And then as it moves forward, it sees the two things go away. And if this train catches up with it, then we're both moving together as well. And the nice thing about this is you can imagine the platform is a stationary reference frame. Um, not perfectly, because the Earth moves um, around in circles and orbits around the sun, and the solar system moves in space. So um, all of these reference frames are ultimately are moving a little bit. But you can imagine we have um, sort of a reference frame in here that we call S that would be a little bit like the platform. Um, you can imagine a reference frame S dash, which would be um, the train that we're sitting on, and a reference frame S dash dash, which would be the train next to us. Okay, for example, just to pick them off against each other. Okay, so we've got reference frames. Now, what do we mean by an inertial reference frame? So if we imagine um, a frictionless puck placed on a surface in some reference frame, and here is where I differ a little bit from Taylor's book. Um, I don't like the diagram in Taylor's book. I find it really misleading. I think the better way to think about it is the diagram that I have in here. So imagine um, what we've got is our two trains, our train platform, and on the platform, they just happen, it happens to be a very nice cold day. The platform is iced over, um, nice clean sheet of ice on it. Hockey player comes up and slides a puck along the surface, and it's traveling at a constant velocity v along that surface, right? Um, you can imagine this also to be a little bit like a person walking along that platform at constant speed. Um, and as the train pulls out, you, you can imagine, you know, that person is likely going fast or slow or whatever, relative, one relative to the other, okay? Um, that puck, because it's frictionless and it's got no forces on it, will travel at constant velocity. Okay, we know that from Newton's first law. If we consider our um, train S, and imagine that our train S, rather than being stopped or slowing into the station or accelerating out of the station, does what happens sometimes when you're going past a station that you're not actually going to stop at. Um, you basically slow down to some velocity that's not zero, travel past the station so you're nice and safe, um, and then speed up afterwards, right? So we've got a train traveling past this platform at a at some speed. And let's imagine for a second that the puck has a speed of um, five kilometers an hour along the platform and the train is coming down the track at five kilometers an hour. Um, if you're sitting on the platform, the, the puck will be traveling at constant velocity. It'll be traveling at a constant velocity along the platform at five kilometers an hour, right? And you know because it's traveling at a constant velocity, it's subjected to no forces because of Newton's first law. If you're on the train, and you're watching that puck, imagine that you happen to be alongside it when it first gets kicked up to speed and you're traveling along together. It's traveling at five kilometers an hour, you're traveling at five kilometers an hour. What do you see with that puck? What you see is that it effectively looks like it's stationary, right? Because it's moving along at the same speed you are. And because it's stationary, its velocity is constant. It's just constant at zero. And um, you, um, trap for a second. Um, that, that velocity is constant at zero, and that means it's subjected to no forces, right? Again, Newton's first law. And so what we can say here is essentially that um, our reference frame S dash, which is the train, is an inertial reference frame because the law of inertia, and the law of inertia is basically the first law says that uh, you know if, if, if something's traveling at constant velocity, it's not subject to force, holds in that reference frame, right? So if I'm looking from this frame, um, an object that has velocity, a constant velocity, is not subjected to any forces. And when that puck is moving along that platform at a constant five kilometers an hour, you can see that it's subjected to no forces, right? And that's um, a sensible thing. Okay, so this is the thing that we would call an inertial reference frame. And at the moment, it might not make complete sense because we haven't done what a non-inertial reference frame is, and that brings us to non-inertial reference frames. Okay, so what we have to do now is think about um, what happens in a non-inertial reference frame. And so this is where we want our second train. So imagine our second train um, is moving along on this second track, and maybe the first one is just not there at the moment, so we don't have to worry about it. So we've got this second train, and we've got our hockey puck on the platform, 
and we set it up so that the puck is moving along at some constant velocity and the train starts moving at the same velocity. So that would be in an inertial reference frame. And then we start to make this train accelerate a little bit. It starts going a little faster. So when this train is at five and this train and the puck is at five, that looks like the velocity on this puck is zero. Um, and then when this is six, it'll be minus one. And when it's seven, it's minus two. And when it's eight, it's minus three. And so if you think about what you see out of that train window, it looks like that puck is actually slowing down relative to your train because you're accelerating, right? But that puck is not actually subjected to any force. Um, and so what's happening is the first law is actually broken in that reference frame. You see something that's traveling um, without any force being applied to it, but the velocity is changing with respect to your reference frame. And that's what we call a non-inertial reference frame because the law of inertia is broken. An object that obviously has no force on it has a velocity that's changing and is being subject to an acceleration, okay? And so that's the big difference between inertial and non-inertial reference frames. And it becomes really important with how you deal with um, problems. Now, um, ultimately, the way you tell the difference from a sort of real definition context is that all inertial reference frames are in a state of constant rectilinear motion with respect to each other. What that means is that the reference frame, two reference frames are either moving in straight lines relative to each other, and they can be moving, you know, even at an angle, or they can be moving against each other but it's, it's a linear motion, right? And the reason why we care about linear motion is because you'll know from first year, if you're going around a circle, you've got an acceleration, okay? Um, and this is the thing that ultimately turns an inertial reference frame into a non-inertial reference frame. If the reference frame you have is accelerating in some way and any rotation automatically involves an acceleration, then that makes that reference frame non-inertial. So um, you can imagine we have two trains going down um, tracks together. There will be inertial reference frames. As soon as one of them starts accelerating, it's no longer a, an inertial um, reference frame, if we're thinking about this other train. Um, and as soon as it goes around a corner, the same thing. Um, and in the real important aspect to this, why do we care, um, is basically because Newton's first law only holds in inertial reference frames. And in order for the second law to hold, we need the first law to hold. Um, and so a lot of times in mechanics, when you get the wrong answer, you get the wrong answer because you assumed you were working in an inertial reference frame when you weren't. And that meant that you assumed that Newton's second law worked when it didn't. And it didn't work because Newton's first law wasn't holding because you weren't in an inertial reference frame, okay? Um, and if we see this another way, what that means is that inertial reference frames are really nice to work with. They make mechanics very easy. And in a lot of cases, we try to set problems up where we're dealing with inertial reference frames because we don't have to worry about all the baggage of dealing with um, correlating um, or connecting two different um, reference frames together. Um, We'll deal with some non-inertial reference frames in this course um, uh, and, and how to deal with that probably a little bit later in the course. Um, one thing to keep in mind is that you can often approximate non-inertial non reference frames as being inertial. And so a good example of that is that um, the Earth is rotating. So technically the Earth is not an inertial reference frame. But if I bounce a ping pong ball on some pots and pans, it would behave exactly as you predict, assuming the reference frame is inertial. And that's ultimately because at the time scales um, and length scales that we care about in our problem, which is the ping pong ball bouncing around the pots, um, the non-inertiality of the um, uh, reference frame doesn't matter very much. And so treating it as an inertial reference frame is a very good approximation, okay? Um, but one case where this breaks down is, um, for example, when you start, um, instead of having your ping pong ball bouncing from a pot, one pot to another pot that's maybe a meter away, what you do is you try to fire a projectile several thousand kilometers um, through the atmosphere, okay? So imagine you're Kim Jong-un, 
and you're launching ballistic missiles um, across the Sea of Japan, then the fact that the Earth is a non-inertial reference frame matters, because if you treat it as an inertial reference frame, then uh, when you're trying to put your missile into the Sea of Japan, your errors are big enough that you perhaps put it into Tokyo, and that would not be a very good thing to do because uh, you end up with uh, wars starting and stuff like that. I just noticed that Kim Jong-un and I probably have the same hairdresser. Anyway, all right, so that's pretty much it for today's lecture. Basically wanted to get on top of Newton's laws and um, inertial and non-inertial reference frames to set ourselves up for later lectures. And then um, in the next lecture, we're gonna deal with some more basic things, um, work, kinetic energy, conservation, for, uh, conservation, conservative forces, those sorts of things. Um, I'll see you in the next lecture.